Okay, I think we are live and good to go. Good evening, everyone, from a warm and calm, for a change, Eastern California evening. My name is Mike Jerry, and I am going to bring you some of the wonderful celestial things in our skies tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to do uh, the Cloudy Nights June Observer's Challenge. And uh, hopefully we will uh, get to see some pretty cool stuff because he, uh, Pat, who put it together for us tonight, has, uh, has a great list going. So <coughs> we will see. Oh, I, I have to plug my headphones in. Okay, so I'm not hearing myself being echoed on the stream. Okay. Now then, let's start by turning off the test pattern so that we see where I currently am right now. Let's make sure our picture looks okay here. My window's all resized on me um, for some reason, so I'm uh, needing to check to make sure that once the screen updates here that uh, you guys are seeing um, my window's okay. Oh, no, that just screwed that up. Okay, well, have to see where that goes. All right. Uh, boy, it does take a while. Okay, yeah, so that looked pretty good. Okay, let's make sure all these are the right size. No, this is not the right size. So it needs to come down here. Okay. So I think that's about right. So right now we are just on Vega. A beautiful bright little star. Well, not little, but a nice bright star that uh, makes a great star to uh, set your focus by. And so that's what I've done. And so, because M57, the Ring Nebula, is really close by, I think we'll just zip over to that and try that for, try that first. Okay, so let's go over to that. And we'll just start with a nice little object, the Ring Nebula. It's a pretty cool one. You can see it already right there. And in fact, we're not going to want to. Uh, we're not going to want to do 60-second exposures on it because that will be just way too much. Okay. In fact, we're going to knock it down to you know, maybe 15 will work. Okay, now we need to do you. And need to set all you correctly. And, oh, come on. Don't go away on me. Set this stuff. My enhancements. And then we can set our histogram a little bit more in there. Yeah. <coughs> this is such a bright little object that even uh, even 15 second exposures are way too much. <laughs> but it's a pretty cool little gadget. A planetary nebula. One of the brighter ones in our sky. In fact, 
I'll back way off on the stretch so we can see the central star a little bit better in it. Yeah, you can kind of see the central star there. Okay, and let's go back to my browser here and fire up a new tab because we're going to need to go to the Cloudy Nights Observing Challenge, which Pat put together a nice, pretty sweet one here. So we're going to start off with a few Messier objects, which I think are all clusters. <coughs> uh, actually, I think 106 is a galaxy. Anyway, um, so M13 is certainly a, a big, bright, and beautiful thing, so we'll jump to that first. But M57 is a very cool little object, so thought it would be a nice way to start. And we were right on Vega to do a, our uh, focusing anyway, so it was a nice, a nice little segue. I'm going to try refreshing this window over here because it is just quite a bit behind. All right. All right. Next target. Let's let our script shut PhD down. There goes our. And let's go out to M13. Which is going to be in Hercules. Yeah, not too far away. So let's start with that one. There it is, a big fuzzy patch moving right on in. In fact, I'm going to plate solve this to bring it into the center a little bit better. There we go. And now we'll start a little sequence on this. And because it's a big bright star cluster, we're not gonna we're gonna back way off on the exposure time again because star clusters are way too bright for 60 second exposures. There we are. Beautiful. I don't know what that one did, so we'll just there we go, and our blacks are pretty clipped. So let's take that and do that. Big bright cluster. Just a beautiful cluster in the sky. Let's actually see what uh, Pat wrote about it. Great Hercules cluster discovered by Evan Haley in 1714. It shows itself to the naked eye when the sky is serene and the moon absent. Fifty years later, it was examined by Charles Messier, who cataloged it in 1764. About 145 light years in diameter, it's composed of several hundred thousand stars, the brighter of which the brightest of which is a red giant. So 
So there's a red giant star in here. But several hundred thousand stars. There are some people who theorize, and I think this is the most popular theory at the moment, that these big, bright, globular clusters like this, which have a lot of very ten densely populated, uh, densely packed stars, uh, unlike open clusters, which are much more loosely concentrated, uh, these globular clusters, uh, it is thought, are actually uh, galaxies that interacted with the Milky Way, collided with it, passed through it, etc. And the Milky Way stripped off most of its stars except for the very core. And so that's why they're so big and bright and uh, beautiful things. Just big, bright concentrations of dense stars. Densely populated. Of course, when a densely populated star still means many light years between each star, because everything in space is mostly space. But uh, it's a pretty fabulous, pretty fabulous thing. Just hundreds of thousands of stars, only the brightest of which we can see. But. goes beyond the resolution of my camera. And you can't, the whole core is kind of blown out, so you can't really see it very well. But if I uh, back off on the stretch, then you can see it, it, it. You lose a lot of the outer stars, but then you can see more of the core is, is in there. Lots and lots and lots of stars, hundreds of thousands, supposedly. So, and this I believe, I believe this is the brightest um, globular cluster in our sky. Is M13? I think it is the biggest and brightest, at least in the northern hemisphere. Our friends in the southern hemisphere have uh, uh, a nice big, a nice big bright cluster, which I think is the brightest one. I think it's Omega Centauri, but I'm not sure about that. <sighs> okay. Oh yeah, I want to also let's start our background music. So we get that tinkle in away in the background. Okay. So that's M13. That's a pretty fun one. Let's do our next target. And what do you have next? M11 or 106. That's oh, 92. M11. And M106. Oh, yeah. Let's do uh, let's do eleven first since we're much closer to that. Got to be a bit further to our south. <coughs> okay, let's go do it. In fact, I'm going to put my light shroud on while I'm doing that. Okay, and what I did not realize was that this is, wow, okay, somehow I am able to see it. This is pointing right at the side of my roof, so I'm quite surprised I can even see this at all. <laughs> but like we can. So, uh, let's see if I can. Oh, I need to plate salt before I can do that. 
Shoot. Okay. Well, let's see if it will plate solve. I mean, I'm literally pointing right at the side of a building here, so it doesn't look to me like this should even be picking up. Yeah, I think it's going to have a hard time even trying to plate solve this. Yeah. So, you know what? M11 is going to have to wait. It's too low. 106 is all the way on the other side. Uh, which I believe involves... Yeah, involves a complete meridian flip. And heading over to that side. So, we're going to go, we're going to skip that one too. We'll do a meridian flip. Uh, what am I doing? This. Okay, so we'll come to... M11's got to wait. M106 is on the other side of the meridian, so we'll wait on that. M27. Okay, let's see where M27 is. That is going to be under Cygnus, which is still too low. Yeah, that because that's under Cygnus. So, yep, that is definitely going to be too low. Okay, can't do that one. Uh, C99. Go under C99. C399. Okay. C399. There's nothing there. C399. Nothing there. CR399. Looks like that. Okay. Yeah, that's uh that's a good one, but again, still too low. NGC six triple eight. Okay, so we're just hanging around Cygnus. Yeah, the Crescent Nebula. That might be high enough. Let's try that one. Again, I'm looking pretty close to a roof, but I think we're over the top of that. I think we're over the top of the roof for this one. Now, the Crescent Nebula, I actually was shooting this one last night, and uh, it was... Uh, it's in such a... it's right in the band of the Milky Way, because Cygnus runs, as you can see here from... Uh, this the white milky band going right through here so it's Cygnus flies right in right through the Milky Way and this is right in the heart of it and uh, so and the plates all failed I don't know why I get this error message and I've told Robin about it, and doesn't, I have never really gotten a clear resolution on why that error message keeps showing up. But every once in a while, it will lose, for some reason, SharpCap will lose track of the mount, and uh, won't be able to find it. And so I just have to re-slew and re-plate solve again. Okay, so now, next target, sorry, let me do. So, like I said, last night I was shooting this, and uh, it's not a very bright nebula. It's a pretty one, but it's not very bright. And sequence halted due to error. What's wrong with PhD? OK. 
Okay, doesn't look like anything is happening here. So let's just try it again. Sometimes things get hung up. Okay, it goes to looping. That's what it should do. There we go. Every once in a while it just gets hung up. Okay. Okay, so this is going to be the Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888. Let's see what NGC 6888, NGC 6888. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say about this little nebula. Oh, that first, first sub is about to come in. Okay, I see the problem. The stack is whacked. All right, and there it is. There's the Crescent Nebula right there. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's not a very bright nebula, and it's in a very dense star field right in the heart of the Milky Way. So it's uh, a little difficult to see, but it's in there. I need to do a little bit of a color balance on this, which always takes out too much red. It's in there. Let me get a little more of a stretch on that, too. So you can see a little better. But the Crescent Nebula is an emission nebula in Cygnus. It's about 5,000 light years away. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1792. Is formed by the fast stellar wind from the Wolf Rayet star WR 136 colliding with and energizing the slower moving wind ejected by the star when it became a red giant around 250 to 400,000 years ago. The result of the collision is a shell and two shock waves, one moving outward and one moving inward. The inward moving shock wave heats the stellar wind to X ray emitting temperatures. It's a rather faint object located about 2 degrees southwest of Saturn. For most telescopes, it requires a UHC or Oxygen 3 filter to see it. Under favorable conditions, a telescope as small as 8 centimeters with filter can see its nebulosity. <coughs> Larger telescopes reveal the crescent or a, a Euro sign shape, which makes uh, some which causes some people to call it the Euro sign nebula because it has a little bit of a, a E shape in here before it goes all the way around. But it's a it's a fairly faint, fairly faint one. And uh, the more I push the stretch, the more it brings out the star field too, so it's kind of a kind of a little bit of a trade-off. I can make the nebula brighter, but it also makes <laughs> the star is brighter as well. Star field that's in the in the foreground. But I 
if you use the uh, if you use a filter, and I'm not using any filters, uh, but if you use a filter, it can knock some of the starlight back and reveal more of the the nebula itself. But <coughs> I don't use filters, and because uh, I don't really have much of any light pollution here, so I get all the light of all the stars that are kind of in front of it, drowning it out a little bit. And in fact, one thing I should do while we're at this is uh, show you my setup. And so this is my current setup, and so what I use is a, a six inch uh, F4 imaging Newtonian telescope, a simple reflector telescope here. And up top where the eyepiece normally goes into the focuser, I have a camera sitting up there, so the camera is what's taking the pictures. And uh, it's all riding on a Celestron Advanced VX equatorial mount that's pointing it and driving it around the sky. And uh, I'm sitting back here behind this laptop right now talking to you. So it's a, it's a very simple, inexpensive, and yet pretty effective uh, kind of telescope, especially if you like doing imaging. The F4 is nice and fast, not too fast, but fairly fast so that it uh, captures photons pretty quickly, which is nice for imaging. All right, well, let's look and see. In fact, let's look and see how our guiding is doing here. I have not been paying attention to this at all. Yeah, it looks like guiding north is working. So, I guess it's keeping us on track. We're getting pretty round stars, so not too bad. Yeah, slightly eggy, but not too bad. <coughs> So let's see what you've got next. So medium, crescent nebula. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. 6210. Okay, back to Hercules. Okay, we like that. NGC 6210. Let's back to Hercules. NGC 6210. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Let's do next target. All right. And then move us to our next NGC 6210. I think we're probably going to be pretty well on it, so let's just start the imaging. Well, that's going along. NGC 6210. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say about oops, NGC 6210. It's a planetary nebula located in Hercules. <laughs> it's approximately five and a half kilo light years. <laughs> five and a half thousand light years. A kilo light years, okay. I assume that's what KLY stands for. A light year. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, so it's a kill off. So it's about 5,500 light years away. All right, let's 
fix our let's fix our thing here and let's see well let's see if we can just find it just looking it's probably going to be somewhere in here so this this is definitely blue in color not that I know that it's blue or not but don't really know that I have seen this one before but I'm thinking that's probably it <coughs> Um, it's positioned about 38 degrees above the galactic plane at a vertical distance. <coughs> this has, uh, blah, blah, blah. The object was first recorded as a star-like feature by Joseph Lalande in March of 1799. However, credit for the discovery of the nebula goes to Wilhelm Struve in 1825. John L. E. Dreyer described it as a planetary nebula, very bright, very small, round disk and border. It's very amorphous and irregular in shape, but forms a rough ellipsoid. So I think this is probably it. But in fact, let's do a uh, just a solve only plate solve, and uh, it'll probably show it that this is it. I don't know if it is really this small, and typically planetary nebula are pretty small. Um, then uh, I will probably um, <laughs> probably won't be able to see much of any detail in it. Yep, sure enough, there it is. That's exactly what it is. That nice bright blue little guy right there. I don't know that we're going to be able to see a lot of detail, if if any, in there. It's just pretty much a bright blob. But let's maybe lose some of the stretch. And if it darkens up, we might be able to see something more. Not looking promising. No, what we might need to do instead is to reduce yeah so what I might do instead is we'll reduce the exposure and restart the stack we'll reduce the exposure to 15 seconds and hope that it's not quite so saturated Which is what we end up having to do with brighter things. Still pretty saturated. But let's see what we can see here. Yeah. It's still pretty saturated. Come on, grab and hold. <laughs> it's still just a little blob. Well, this is one of the ch one of the harder ones. Yeah, there's not much to see there. It just looks like a blue star. If you look at the Hubble image of it. It's got some pretty interesting shape. But the Hubble we are not. We can certainly see it, but let's try dropping a, another. Let's try dropping another. Halving the exposure again. See if we can see anything more. No, it looks pretty much spherical. 
to my camera. It doesn't look much different shape from the star. Maybe it's a little bit of a blob coming out here, but I can show you if I go here and pull up Wikipedia for you guys. What? No, what? That is not what I typed. Uh, gotta go through the stupid search engine. NGC 6210. Nope. 6210. And so you can see from the Hubble image here that it actually has quite a bit of detail in it. Um, it's a very oddly shaped thing with gases spewing out all over the place. Um, so that's what the Hubble can see. But with our modest little camera, um, all we get is, where the heck is it? All we get is this because it's just so small it's actually kind of well beyond the resolution of our camera to see anything in it. So not really going to be much helpful there. Well, we can say we saw it, but not much more than that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. Let's see what else we can. Okay, that can go away. That can go away. That can go away. That can go away. Uh, I see fifteen forty six. Herschel, I see fifty one forty six. I see fifty one forty six. Mm, back to the nav again. How low is that? Uh, we should be able to see that one. The cocoon nebula, it's a little bit low. Let's see what NGC 6946 is. That's better. That's higher. Oh, yeah, the fireworks galaxy, right. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's see. I've already got you ready to go. So, let's go. Okay, let's do a plate solve on that. Off by almost half a degree. This will put it right in the center of our sensor. And you can kind of see a little bit of something there. Oh, look at that. All right, start imaging. So a galaxy. Now this is a galaxy. Hopefully we'll be able to see a little color on, but not many galaxies do you get to see color on. But this is uh, called the fireworks galaxy because it has so much starburst activity in it. And so it's got a lot of blue regions in it. But we'll have to see what our uh, our camera can see. Does it have an image of it in here? Yeah. 
It's a pretty one. Fairly sizable too, so hopefully we'll be able to get a decent image. Normally the monochrome camera is better for galaxies, but this one's probably a pretty bright one. Okay, get that. Get this. And get this. Yeah, that's pretty. I can also make that go away there. NGC 6946, according to Wikipedia, sometimes referred to as the fireworks galleries of galaxy is a face-on intermediate spiral galaxy the small bright nucleus actually let's see what Pat wrote about it uh, discovered by William Herschel in 1798 it's a well-studied galaxy about one-third the size of the Milky Way contains roughly half the number of stars 10 supernovae have been discovered uh, so it's called the firework because of sun because so many supernovae have been discovered in it that uh, it's called the fireworks galaxy. There's always stuff popping off on it. Push that stretch a little more. In fact, let's do a color balance too. total. That's pretty darn good for an AVX. So, not complaining. How is the yeah, so yeah, the RA and deck are pretty much level, so we should have some pretty round stars. Yeah, those are pretty round. Okay. Well, let's see if 10 minutes worth of sub exposures will bring out any any little pockets pockets of color. Okay, it's an intermediate spiral galaxy uh, with a small bright nucleus whose location in the sky straddles the boundary between the northern constellation of Cepheus and Cygnus. Its distance from Earth is about 25 million light years, similar to the distance of M101 in the constellation Ursa Major. Both were once considered to be part of the local group, but are now known to be among the dozen bright spiral galaxies near the Milky Way, but beyond the confines of the local group. <coughs> this NGC 6946 actually lies within the Virgo supercluster. Discovered by William Herschel in 1798, it has a diameter of approximately one-third the size of the Milky Way, or 40,000 light-years. 
Uh, it is heavily obscured by interstellar matter due to its location close to the galactic plane of the Milky Way. Due to its prodigious star formation, it has been classified as an active starburst galaxy. Various unusual celestial objects have been observed within NGC 6946. This includes a so-called red ellipse along one of the northern arms that looks like a super bubble or very large supernova remnant and which may have been formed by an open cluster containing massive stars. There are also two regions of unusual dark lanes of nebulosity A third peculiar object discovered in 1967 is now known as Hodges Complex. This is one thought to be a young supergiant cluster, but in 2017 it was conjectured to be an interacting dwarf galaxy superimposed huh, on NGC 6946. So are we getting any... Uh, let me push the stretch a little bit more. We've got a few more subs in. Rips and puffs of light. I don't know we're getting any much color. The Chandra X-ray Observatory has a very blue picture of it, but that's doing X-rays. We don't do no X-rays. little galaxy though. galaxies down in here. What do we determine? 27 was still too low. This one was still too low. This one we've done. This one we've done. This one I think was still too low. Only 106, I think, was. One thing I do need to be careful of, though, is that I don't um, where, where was 106? Okay, yeah, it's well it's well up above. Okay, no, that's not a problem. Okay. Good. That's way up by there. So we're good. There's ten minutes on our nice fireworks galaxy. That's a pretty one. Don't know that I saw much color in it, but it certainly is pretty. And a big bed of stars. 
Okay. Let's turn off our guiding. Turn that off. Where are we headed to next? We aren't doing 106. We can do 106 in a bit. That's all too low. We did this one, this, these, this one. We did this one. That's too low. All right, let's try our real challengers. NGC 5577. NGC 5577. Whoa, where am I going here? I, uh, Arcturus, where Arcturus, I believe, has already crossed over. Yeah, Arcturus is just on the other side. So this is just on the other side of the meridian. So we need to do a flip for that one. 5576. Fifty-five seventy-six. Seems like it should be right next to each other, huh? Fifty-five seventy-six. Yeah, they are. So I guess these are all in the same spot, and they're all involving a meridian flip, <laughs> which I can do. So there's Virgo, Leo, yeah, so this is all the way back down there in the southeastern sky, southwestern sky, excuse me. All right, well then why don't we just do Now let's just flip over there. What the heck? All right, I'll guide some cables here while the scope flips around. Okay, typically, even though it says to reduce the number of stars, typically it wants to have more stars. So, typically it wants more exposure. So, I'm going to give it more. Yeah, boom. Off by four degrees. Greg, didn't see you pop on there. Really, you got Breeze out there? Huh. That's, uh, we are absolutely, completely dead calm here. So, I know you guys in Vegas sometimes get, uh, get slightly different weather from us. You'll get rain when we won't, or we typically get more clouds than we do, but... For us having such a dead calm night, I'm surprised to hear that you're getting you're getting uh, breezes. So we're just getting absolutely nothing. It's perfect 
warm, completely calm. Seeing is fairly steady, so it's a pretty nice night here. Okay. Let's get our blacks unclipped here. Solve so we can do the yeah so there's 5577 over here in fact I'm going to realign that plate solve because things are a little bit off I saw when you solve in sync um, uh, it's doing pretty well uh, the AVX um, is uh, doing pretty well. Uh, I'll show you in a second here. Yeah, so there's 5577, 5576, and uh, this one here I'm assuming. That one there must be 74. Yeah, it is. For some reason, it's just not highlighting. But these are all three of the targets. So these are all three of 77, 76, and 74 are all right here. Right, these three right here that are lined up. So yeah, so these are the ones discovered by George Stoney. Um, so those are all three of our galaxies. So well, that's building there. Uh, yeah, it's doing actually pretty well. Uh, let's see how my guiding is doing. Eh, it's up to 1.5 total. I was down to like 1.1, 1 1.2 a minute ago. So it's standing up to guiding fairly well. Um, I just did a, a good multi-run pack train session on it a little while ago, and uh, that seems to have helped. Boy, now the RA is just doing crazy stuff. <laughs> I don't know what's up there. Yeah, it was it was much better about five ten minutes ago, but um, did a supernova recently in Virgo? I don't think so. I don't think I've been uh, on a supernova recently. Do you have the? Was that, I assume it's. Uh, do you have the NGC number of the galaxy that it was in, or? Because we can definitely go to it here in a little bit. Just got a couple of targets left here. On our observing challenge, and then we can do pretty much, pretty much whatever. Okay, so it's in 4647. Oh, hey, Curtis. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I thought it was Greg who asked the question about my AVX. It was you. Um, yeah, it seems to be doing pretty well, you know, for an AVX. It's definitely not a $2,000 mount by any stretch. But, uh, oh, yeah, and I've done a big meridian flip, so I may actually have to change my guiding to guide south. I have to do a unidirectional uni guiding on this because the declination... The backlash in deck is so bad, <laughs> it's so large that uh, I can't, uh, you can't guide both directions because the backlash is just way too big. So I'm having to uh, guide unidirectionally and it uh, seems that I can guide direction north in pretty much every quadrant except the southwestern quadrant of the sky. And, uh, well, it seems to come back to the south side again, so maybe, maybe it'll settle out here for a few minutes. We'll see. But here's our three galaxies. Let's see where 
where 4647 is. NGC 4647. That's yeah, right next door here. Just above the tail. Yeah, actually, I should be able to see that. So we'll do that here next. It's a little getting a little bit lower, but I should be able to pick that up without too much problem. <coughs> Get a couple more minutes on our trio here. Back to Pat's thing. 76 and 74 were first seen by William Herschel. The faintest member of the so 77 is the faintest member. It's a barred spiral, highly elongated, with a diffuse streak along the center of its major axis. Yeah, but it is a pretty one. It's the one. It's the one that seems to have the most interest. This one just looks like an ellipse. That one looks like a little bit of a spiral too, although pretty. It's an elliptical. Yeah. So the brightest and largest. Yeah. So this is 76 here. It's an elliptical bright halo containing a circular core and stellar nucleus. And then this one down here, 30, it's MAG-13, a small satellite of 5576. It's a moderately faint halo. Yeah, so it is a little bit, just barely, you can tell it's a spiral there. Okay, yeah, I was just actually going to ask you, Greg, if it's uh, if it's the supernova is still there, but it's only been a couple of weeks, so hopefully it'll still be there. Well, we'll find out. Just want to see how much detail we can pull out of these, especially this one up here, which is what seventy-seven, yeah. Yeah, 77 is kind of nice. Got sort of an inner, inner bit here, and then more faint, diffuse arms outside it. Should push this stretch a little bit more. Pick up just a little more detail on the live stream. Look at your link for reference. Oh, did you try putting a link in the chat? Because if you did, I think links are blocked in chat. Yeah, that made it a little too noisy. That made it a little too noisy. Unfortunately, there seems to be about a 45 second delay tonight in uh, the stream between when I do something and it actually shows up. Yeah, it's uh, it's probably blocked. Um, I don't think YouTube lets lets you put anything. Um, I'll put to let you put any link in the chat. Otherwise, people are just spamming live streams and whatnot all the time. So, but anyway, that's a nice little, uh, nice little trio. Only mods can put in links, so you have to make Greg a moderator if you want him to post a link. I'm not sure I would even know how to do that. In fact, I am sure I wouldn't know how to do that. someone a moderator. Manage moderators. Oh.
paste the channel URL of a user to add as a paste the channel URL of a user to add as a moderator. Okay, well maybe I can just do it right in here. Let's see if I can just right click on you. Add moderator. Greg McKay is now a moderator for your channel. Okay. So yeah, basically you hover hover over their name in the chat and there's three little dots show up on the right. You right click on that and the menu shows up. And so I just made you a moderator on my channel. So you should now be able to paste the link in, if Mr. Curtis is correct, and usually he is, about such things. <coughs> okay. Ah, there it is. Okay. Uh, all right, well, let's go over, what is it, NGC 4647. I think I already picked it up in here. Yes, I already did, so we just need to shut down our thingamajiggy here and go to 4647. Hope it's not too low. No, it's plenty. We're plenty high up there. Okay, well, definitely a galaxy there. Oh, and a nice uh, satellite blazing right on through. Let that go through, and then we'll start some. <coughs> Okay, so we'll see what we come up with here in the meantime. Let me go to see if I can. Go to Greg's picture. M60. Okay, so it's kind of like between the two of them. All right. Well, let's see what we can see on our own, y'all. Wow, very bright. I need to back this black level off a bit. stretched back all of this off but it looks like it's probably still there because I'm still seeing a dot there so it looks to me like if that is it that that is it so that must be it, it looks like just like your diagram yep M60 and NG47. Yeah, that's that's got to be it right there. So I guess it's still there, glowing nice and bright. I guess glowing, blazing. Yep. How far away is NGC 4647? NGC 4647. So in other words, how long ago did this actually happen? It's an intermediate spiral galaxy estimated to be around 63 million light years away in Virgo. Discovered by herself. 63 million years. So this wonderful supernova happened about 63 million years ago <laughs> and we're just just seeing it now the 
light finally just got here. Galaxies called ARP, their designation, blah blah blah. Uh, an optical image of the two galaxies, uh, the M60, this nice big elliptical here, and NGC 4647. Um, in optical images, the two galaxy disks overlap. This is suggests an ongoing interaction. However, images do not reveal any signs of star formation, which would have been caused by tidal interaction between the two. Recent studies of Hubble images made in 2012 of the two galaxies indicate that tidal interactions between the two have just begun. Oh, interesting. Okay, so they're a fairly new pair. Fairly new interaction. The gas in 4647 has been mildly disturbed. The galaxy's location in the Virgo cluster suggests that it might... Uh, that might it suffered an effect known as ram pressure stripping caused by the inter intracluster medium. Another explanation may be hot gas in the halo of M60. M60 may have increased the pressure of gas on the eastern side of 4647 through either ram pressure striping, st striping or bow shock between the two galaxies causing the observed asymmetry of gas in the galaxy. difficulty is that the galaxies would have to be so close to the side of the land, blah blah blah. Okay, <coughs> I'm going to have to refresh my page here because my video has frozen on my uh, thingamajiggy here. There we go, now I'm back to seeing live video. Four, five, no. okay. Well, cool. Thanks for pointing that out, Greg. Uh, supernova. I've seen those before, but didn't know this was an active one. That's pretty cool. So, 63 million years ago, this star blew up to the point where it's... I mean, this one star is almost as bright as the core of the, uh, the whole galaxy. Which is how what supernovae do. They're just so massive that one star can become as bright or even brighter than the entire galaxy that it's in. The energy released is so massive in a supernova. And that's a pretty bright. I mean, that looks like a star. That looks like a foreground star in our galaxy. Heck, that's brighter than most of the stars in our galaxy that are in front of this thing, with the exception. Maybe it's almost about the same brightness as that. Amazing. Just awesome amounts of energy. Coolies. Okay, so we did 77, 76, 74. Um, this one was too low because it was in Cygnus, but that now is. We're going to be doing that here in a little bit. These two also were around Cygnus. We'll be doing those shortly. 106 was the one that we had. We needed to do a meridian flip for. So. Yeah, if one exploded inside our Milky Way, I don't know. I mean, I think we may go through a long period of no night. <laughs> it's uh, We probably would have two suns in the sky. You know, depending on where the heck it was. It would be interesting. You know, if it's somewhere in the plane of our galaxy, how close it was to us. If it was far away, then it would probably be pretty close to the plane of the Milky Way itself. So, seasonally, depending on what season we were in, we'd have it high above or not so much. But 
Okay, cool. Well, thanks for that, Greg. That was fun. Let's see a supernova. Let's go back to our list here and see if we can pick up M106 now. We should be... In fact, I think we're not too far at all from it. Well, it's actually going to be above. It's going to be, I think, up here. Yeah. Let's move to M106. <coughs> oh, it looks like maybe it down here. Let's plate solve on it. Bring it to the center. <coughs> Now suddenly you're going to get all fussy again and decide you need longer exposure to plate solve. Sometimes you do just fine with one second, sometimes you just need more. No, nope. well you want four seconds. Jeez. Fussy, fussy, fussy. Well, that's clearly it down here. It's just going to bring it up half a degree, put it right in the center. Doink. All right, we'll take a nice gander at M106 here. As soon as the amount settles out. All right, start imaging, 533. Get our guiding going. <laughs> All right. M106. Discovered by Pierre Machin in 1781, but not added to Charles Messier's catalog until 1947 by Helen Sawyer Hogg. It appears reasonable to assume that Machin had intended to add it to a future edition along with M105 and M107. William Herschel cataloged M106 in 1788. It's a large, massive type SB spiral with a tightly wound structure tilted 25 degrees to our line of sight. This orientation explains partly why the galaxy's dust lanes are so prominent is a large, massive type SB spiral. Hmm. Large and massive, huh? Okay. Let's go take a look at its largesse. I think I've done these recently with the mono, but I haven't done them with a color camera. Obviously got another little player here too. In fact, we can take this and I'll just do a regular straight plate solve because we slewed a bit, so we're going to need to do a plate solve to get accurate positions of the annotations. Yeah, 4248 is here, so that's NGC 4248, which is there, which is a MAG-12-5 galaxy. Forty-two, forty-eight. A little companion. Actually, there's a little something here too. Yeah, well, you can see it. I'm sure it showed up. I just deleted it, but yeah. UGC seventy-three fifty-six, mag fifteen, mag seventeen out here, mag seventeen five, mag seventeen nine, huh? Seventeen seven. Anyway, look at the satellites blazing through our image. But 106 is pretty nice. About to pull in another sub here. Stretch that a little more. As soon as that third sub lands, I'll do another color balance. Yeah, 
yeah, we are we're still dead calm here, Greg, so having a having a good night here. It's been just such a windy spring and early summer. Finding a night with low wind has been a challenge this spring, but it's also been cool. We tend to get more wind with cooler weather, so not complaining about the cool weather. I mean, gosh, did it even hit 90 at your house this weekend? It was only about like 90, 91, 92 here all weekend. It was absolutely crazy. I was out riding my bike <clears throat> yesterday morning about 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. Normally this year, uh, by this time of year, 11 o'clock in the morning, and you're getting pretty warm out there. But, man, I was in a T-shirt. It was almost too cool for a, t for a T-shirt. It was just gorgeous. So, I'm not complaining about the temperatures. But I'm actually getting a little cool now, so I'm going to run in real quick and grab a another layer. Be right back. Okay, that's better. I was around 90 yesterday. It was 69 when I woke up at 6 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Today it's starting to warm up again, probably mid to high 90s. Yeah. Yeah, we hit probably 100 here today. But, uh, boy, this weekend was just amazing. Just gorgeous. This is starting to fill in kind of nice. In Canis Venetici, it was discovered by Pierre Marchand. It's about 25 million light years away. It contains an active nucleus classified as a type 2 Seyfert, <coughs> and the presence of a central supermassive black hole has been demonstrated from radio wavelength observations of the rotation of a disk of molecular gas orbiting within the inner light year around the black hole. It has a water vapor mega maser, equivalent of a laser operating in microwaves instead of visible light in an intergalactic scale. <laughs> it has a water vapor mega maser, which is the equivalent of a laser operating in microwave instead of visible light and on a galactic scale. <laughs> Whoa. That is seen by the 22 gigahertz line of ortho water H2O that evidences dense and warm molecular gas. Water masers are useful for observing nuclear accretion disk in active galaxies. Water masers in M106 enable the first case of direct measurement of a distance to a galaxy, thereby providing an independent anchor for the cosmic distance ladder. M106 has a slightly warped, thin, almost edge-on Keplerian disk, which is a, on a sub-parsec scale. It surrounds the central area with a mass of blah blah blah. It is one of the largest and brightest nearby galaxies, similar in size and luminosity to the Andromeda Galaxy. The supermassive black hole at the core has a mass of... yeah. 
it looks like about 40 millions of solar masses. 3.9 times 10 to the 7th, which I believe is 40 million. So it has approximately 40 million times the mass of our sun, which is, you know, not exactly something you could put in your pocket. So 40 million times the mass of our sun. Hmm. It's got just these nice, interesting little wings coming off one here and shoo, one kind of there. Uh, yeah, the braid stacking. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it will take it would take quite a few subs to get rid of that. I think it has dimmed it a bit, but it would take quite a few subs to get rid of it entirely. That was a really big bright one. And Robin has put in a, a satellite trail removal tool into the more uh, recent versions, but I've never been very successful at being able to use it, so. Yeah, we're getting some nice little clouds and stuff in, in here. You start getting pixelated. But I could even back off a little bit on the on the stretch. Uh, I am shooting at about 610 millimeters of focal length. And back off on the stretch, we get even more detail in the core. We lose some of the outer outer bits, but. You're not too much above that, are, are you? I forget what you're... You're on a 5-inch refractor now, right? With a reducer, so you're probably only at about 750 or something at this point, aren't you? Not too far off where I am. off a little bit more. We'll lose a little bit more of the outside, but we'll get even more detail on the core. <coughs> but that's the game you play. Oh, you're at 1200 at F8. Oh, are you not using a reducer on that? I thought you had a reducer, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're just shooting at full focal length. <coughs> yeah, my little newt is uh, it's a six inch f four, so I'm shooting at just a just a hair over six hundred millimeters of focal length. And uh, although what I'm what I need to be picking up here is a a better coma corrector because the MPCC is uh, my images could be better with a better focal uh, better coma corrector so 
I'm trying to find a Skywatcher Quattro coma corrector on the used market, but they just don't seem to be any. And uh, oh, you're just using a flattener. You'd have a 0.7 reducer flattener. You're not using it this season. Well, if you're shooting small stuff, focal length is nice. If you can handle the exposure time on the slower the slower photons it's pretty nice but that 0.7 reducer eh, well I'm more of an EAA guy I like speed you're more of an AP guy you like more longer subs more detailed and with that nice big frack you can do that some nice detail well let's about 14 minutes on this object. But that came out pretty well, I think. You got the. You can see a lot of detail in the core like this, and if we stretch the heck out of it, we can see a lot more of the periphery. But it is a pretty cool. Pretty cool object. M106. All right, what else we got? We did, we didn't do, okay, so now I think, now the only things that we've missed were the things that we couldn't do earlier because they were too low, because they're in Cygnus. But Cygnus is now up another good 10, 15 degrees, 20 degrees. So now we can probably do M11 and Colander 399, et cetera, et cetera. It just means I have to do another Marine flip. But I think we're in a pretty good spot where I could do that now. So let's next target. Stop our guiding. How was our guiding doing? I haven't looked at guiding forever. 1.19. Guiding under 1.2 for an AVX. That's pretty darn good. Happy with that. Okay, so we're ready on that. I think was Meridian Flippe. Oh, it's all the way down the southwestern, south, you know, southwestern sky, huh? Uh, southeastern. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's do one of the other ones that are closer to Cygnus because that'll be on the way there. So. Let's do CR 399. CR 399. Yeah. All right. All right, and let me hand guide my cables here on the Meridian flip. have cable management that allows me to do this unbidden, but that's okay. I like being out with the scope anyway, especially on a night like this. Just gorgeous out here. Uh, okay. solve. Earlier you were doing plate solves in one second. Hey, look at that. It's back to this. He likes doing one second plate solves in the eastern sky. Doesn't like so much doing it in the western sky. Uh, oh, you're guiding it poor at point four eight right now. Not to brag. Yeah, right. Like I'm buying that. You're not bragging. I've seriously on the used market though. A couple of CEM 40s have come up recently. And it's like, oh man, that would be nice. That would be nice. But I don't know. I don't want to have a two plus thousand dollar mount. Sorry, my dear. It's, uh, I don't know, somehow offends my sensibilities to want to spend that much money just on one component of one hobby. 
I don't know. But yeah, I, the ioptron mounts are definitely, definitely nice. It's nice to get away from worm and spur gear and, and get to uh, <coughs> belt drive uh, would be nice. Coat hanger. Oh, this. Oh, coat hanger. Oh, good lord. Oh, this is actually. He's actually. <laughs> this is actually the coat hanger. Okay. Well. Uh. I'm. Yeah. This is probably going to be a little bit too big for us to do here. But let's see. And I'm probably at 60 seconds of exposure. I'm going to have way too many stars in this picture to pick it out well, but we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> I only get like seven or eight or ten of the stars of the whole thing, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit too big at an object. Which ones have I got in here? That triangle right there, I think it's that triangle right there. Yeah, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, see, so I've got these three and these two. Yeah, so I've got these seven stars, eight stars, right there. Boom, 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 boom. And then this is the bottom of it. And that's the hook of the coat hanger. So you don't want to know what I paid for the Chroma 3 nano? Yeah, well, Chroma. Yeah. No, I know what the Chroma filters go for. And that's. Having a full set of those is a small mortgage. Um, send me an email with the details on the corrector that you're talking about. Oh, it's a it's the Skywatcher um, Quattro Coma Corrector is what I'm looking for. And um, <coughs> it's uh, it's basically about a hundred bucks cheaper than the Teleview Paracore, um, and which is one reason that I like it. The other reason that I like it is that it does not have a magnification, aka speed penalty on it. Um, it does not slow your scope down. Uh, there were a, a couple of nice Paracore twos have shown up on the used market recently, and I've been tempted by them, but. You know, I don't really. I, I like being at f4. I got a imaging nuke because I wanted to be at f4, and you put the paracore in it, and you're at f4.7. It's like I don't. You know, I don't like. I'm sure the optical quality is second to none, but I don't like the speed penalty. So. <coughs> don't like the speed penalty. Okay, broke his cluster, also known as Colonel CR. Random grouping of stars located constant of Velpecula, near the supporter of Sagitta, for an asterism, which has given rise to his name as the coat hanger. Yes, it is a coat hanger. It's got the straight part down here and then the hook up here. And it's, a, it's actually a wonderful binocular target. It's great to get out there with binocs or small telescopes. And, uh, and check it out because it does. It looks just like a coat hanger. It's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool little thing. Uh, M27. Okay, so this would be the apple core or dumbbell, as it's sometimes called. And that's going to be right here in the area as well. So we'll go to that next. We don't need to spend much time on coat hanger. It's pretty star. You can, well, you can see a heck of a dense star field. It looks kind of nice there. But let's go to the Dumbbell Nebula. Yeah. Which will look pretty pretty in color. Uh, is it this one? Do, 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 do. Yep, that would be the one. 
yep, and I could, you know, I could pop 450 bucks for it, but I'd really rather not. I'd really rather have a used one. They, they typically go for about 300 bucks or so on the used market, so that's what I'd kind of like to get a hold of, but yeah. Yeah, I'm always on CN as well. I check CN several times a day. So, that's in fact, you may have seen my wanted ads for them that I posted. So, um, okay. So, anyway, here we are. I have, have I not? I didn't do a start imaging. Oh, okay. That would be helpful if I actually started the imaging. Yeah, I could bite the bullet and just pay full price for a new one. Oh, here we go. Halted due to error. Try it again. If not, we'll go over and see what. Start imaging. 533. Every once in a while, PhD and SharpCap decide to not get along. But they usually sort their stuff out without too much delay. Too bad. Uh, I remember the first time I looked at the coat hanger visually in my scope, it was pretty cool. So obvious. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I like looking at it in my Astro Bonnet binos. It's a good bat it's a good uh, good binocular target. Okay, so back off on our stretch here like most planetary nebulae 60 seconds is probably a bit much for it but M27 a pretty one we'll get more aggressive on the stretch as we get more subs in but Definitely a pretty little nebula. One of the largest neb uh, planetary nebula we can see. You got your old CGX and Oh, really? You still have the old ones? I'm surprised. I thought you had already sold those off. Yeah, shipping stuff. That is the biggest. Yeah, making a local sale <laughs> is a lot easier. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in fact wanting to sell my, my Evolution um, now that I'm on the AVX and enjoying it selling the evolution kind of makes sense and I have the nice HD wedge the heavy-duty wedge with it too um, but I don't have any of the original boxes so it's uh, yeah I've been hesitating on selling them just because I <laughs> don't uh, don't have the boxes and shipping is ridiculously expensive Yeah, well, it's still selling pretty well. The prices of everything have still gone up. There's still supply chain issues. And, uh, you know, most manufacturers of new gear are still way behind. So the used market is still going along pretty well. Not Maybe not as well as a year ago, but still going along pretty well. Let's see. SCA twenty seven. How far away is this? I think it's like four or five thousand. 
Planetary Nebula, Nebulosity surrounding a white dwarf. The constellation Belpegula, 1300, oh, it's only 1400 light years away. It was the first such, which is why it's so big compared to most every other planetary nebula that we can see, which is very small and bright like the one that we saw earlier. This one is just only 1400 light years away, it's pretty close. Dumbbell Nebula appears shaped like a prolate spheroid and is viewed from our perspective along the plane of its equator. In 1992, Moreno Corral et al. computed that its rate of expansion angularly was <sighs> viewed from our distance no more than 2.3 arc seconds per century. From this, an upper limit to the age of 14,600 light years may be determined. So 15,000 years ago. 1970, Bohusky, Smith, and Weedman found an expansion velocity of 31 kilometers per second. Given its semi-minor axis radius of one light year, this implies that the kinematic age of the nebula is about 9,800 years. <coughs> so somewhere in the 10 to 15,000 uh, Like many nearby planetary nebulae, the dumbbell contains knots. Its central region is marked by a pattern of red, dark and bright cusped knots and their associated dark tails. The knots, in very, the knots vary in appearance from symmetric objects with its tails to rather irregular tailless objects, similar to the Helix and Eskimo nebulas. It's really kind of a pain in the butox. But, okay, let's see. We can probably push the stretch a bit more now. We've got some subs in it. Really brighten that thing up. And let me try color balancing. Yeah, I give it a little more color, a little more punch. Twenty-seven is, you know, this is one of the the easier targets. It's close. It's bright. It's colorful. It's in a pretty star field because it's right in the Milky Way. Yeah, it's a pretty nice one.
as the mind still seems to indicate it's five viewers watching. Have you been doing uh, any uh, broadcasts on Night Skies Network? Have you ever gotten your profile accepted? Why do the vertical spikes appear to be doubled? Um, what that means, I think, is that the spider veins that are causing those are not perfectly straight. Um, because my secondary actually has to be a little off-center <coughs> to, uh, to center the secondary mirror under the focuser. And so, as a result, the vertical veins are not exactly square, perpendicular to each other, and so it, it makes the makes the uh, the spike the diffraction spikes look doubled. <coughs> I actually just got a nice uh, cat's eye collimation kit off the used market um, that I did find on Cloudy Nights, and uh, so I'm going to go through and really touch up the collimation on this scope here some point soon but you never got accepted and tried three times damn that's that seems odd you know Curtis was just on here too and he's part of that team um, darn Curtis you aren't still here are you he was here earlier Curtis, if you're here, speak up. But, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's odd. I'm not sure why. Did you, you never got a response at all, I guess, of any kind. It's pretty odd. Oh, well. Well, I hope you can get on at some point. Um, did you try going on to the forum? Because there is a forum associated with it as well. And if you can't do that, I could, uh, I could get on the forum. And, uh, uh, you know, make some inquiries. It's not a very active forum, but still, there are people there. That I could ask. Not sure we really see the knots in here so much. Maybe up here is a few of the knots. Down here maybe is a couple. Hmm. Okay. Well, send me an email to remind me, and uh, I'll post on the forum and say, hey, I got a friend, co you know, contact him from there. Hmm. My uh, OBS is claiming a disconnection, but looks like we're back. Okay, anyway, let's see what else we got here. So we did the coat hanger. And we just did M27. We did M106 earlier. Uh, 11. M11. That's the one. That I think that's the only one we haven't done is M11. So let's do M11. I think that's the last one. Which is good because I'm about done for the night anyway. But M11. Let's see how our guiding was doing. 1.5. Yeah, not terrible. About average. Okay, M11. Doink. Where are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. So now we're going to have to. Oh. 
shoot. South, oh no, southeastern. Okay, not not a meridian flip. Good. Really didn't want to do another meridian flip. Okay. Oh well, yeah. Don't need to do a plate solve to find that one. That one is definitely right there. In fact, I don't even know we need to even do any stacking. Big bright cluster. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're definitely going to want to stack to get rid of some noise. Start imaging, but I'm definitely going to want to back way down from the 60 second exposure. Alright. We're going to no, not want to do 60 seconds on this. Probably four seconds would be about right. Yeah, let's get her. That is a big, bright, beautiful cluster. Not quite as spectacular as M13. Still pretty nice. Hey, thanks for the thumbs up, whoever gave it to me. thumbs up my own thing. I think I can. Can I give myself a thumbs up? <laughs> I can. I can give my own live stream a thumbs up. There we go. Cool. How are you doing? 1.6. Yeah, I had to take up a bunch of backlash after the slew. should be doing. That RA whopping all over the place. <laughs> Must be an AVX. RA all over the place. Huge amounts of deck backlash to suck up. <laughs> fun fun with a $1,000 mount. You'd think a $1,000 mount might be a good mount. You would be wrong. But it's adequate, even though Celestron markets it as an astrophotography mount, it really isn't. It really is a visual mount. <coughs> Some nice dark dust patches here. Dark nebula patches in the rich star field. Because this is right in the yeah, right in the Milky Way itself. So there's M eleven. I think that finishes our list. We did thirteen, eleven, one oh six. Da, 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 da. Cocoon. Haven't done Cocoon yet. Okay. We can do Cocoon. Alright. I see 
5146. Cocoon Nebula. Back to the northern part of the sky. Okay. Sent you an email, by the way. Good. All right. I will poke my head into the forum and find out what's going on. Oh, the cocoon nebula. Seems to me this sucker's pretty faint. No, twelve three. That's not too bad. Well, let me see if I can plate solve on this. Center it. Probably going to be pretty close. Yeah, a third of a degree. Start the imaging. This one's going to be a faint one, so we'll definitely have to do a 60 second exposure on this. Boink. Alright. Cocoon Nebula. Let's see what we can see. an hour, huh? Okay. Now I obviously need to reset my histogram because Oh, there it is way down there. Crap. That's further out than I expected. Okay, no, I want to reposition that. That's too far out. <coughs> That's too far out. This will put it in the middle, though. Yeah, there it is. Okay, let's start again. Start again. Last time I did cocoon. Been a while since I've shot cocoon. And we get to start over again. Yay! But I think that's everything. I think cocoon is the last one. We definitely did these three. 6946, 6210. There's a small blue dot that we could never resolve any detail in. Doing cocoon now. We did the, uh, the crescent coat hanger, dumbbell, and the three M objects. Yes. That is the list. So we're good on that. Oh, you like that? Yeah, the dark nebula above it? Yeah. That didn't. That wasn't the problem. The problem is I, because I'm using this MPCC and not a good coma corrector. You got to stay to the middle. So you get weird optical aberrations off to the sides. So I 
gotta I gotta keep the desired objects in the middle or they just look funky funky so I mean it doesn't do too badly but and I've been able to get away with using it because I only use one inch sensors so it's a lot less demanding but still everything could be sharper and clearer with you know it's a basically this is a two element corrector whereas the good coma correctors like the Skywatcher Quattro and the Paracor are four element units and they just you know just like a an APO is better than a an achromat refractor the more correction the more lenses you have in there the more correction you do just the better everything looks so same thing with the coma corrector which is basically a complex little refractor in itself Now, did you get the CM70G? Which which one do you have? Or just a straight CM70? Forget which one. Oh, there's right there. CM70. No, you just you didn't say. Oh, you have the E. Oh, 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 okay. You got the one with the... Yeah. You got the spendy one. Of course you do. Of course you have the spendy one. But yeah, the... The encoders. Yep. Well, that would certainly help you with the... With that uh, RMS guiding. Being so low. Where's mine at right now? 1.4 well this is not too bad for me though um, before I did the extended PEC training um, I was typically 1.7 1.8 and now I'm I'm usually around 1.3 so it seemed that the PEC training definitely seemed to help so, uh, I'm glad I did it. But, at the end of the day, it's still an AVX. It's still a $1,000 mount, so it's still not going to be... It ain't going to be a CEM70 or a CEM40 or any of that kind of stuff. But for the 60-second subs I do, it keeps the stars pretty round. So... I'm pretty happy with it. I'm going to probably push the stretch a little more. <laughs> I get a little more detail out of that. Well, 
of my cables are pretty pretty loose and hangy. You know, I mean if by tugging you mean just the weight of the cables themselves, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to do much about that, but No, my cables aren't uh, aren't very tight. I'm not doing a CGX day. I got a perfect balance in PA and still not get decent guiding if there was too much pull on the cables. Yeah, no, oh, I yeah, I I absolutely can believe that. Yeah. Depending on the side of the which side of the meridian you're on and how you have it balanced or not balanced can all make a big difference. There we go. One and a quarter. It's uh yeah, if I spend time on something, the um, the guiding numbers go down. I think it's a heuristic algorithm that it uses on the RA axis. And so if I spend more than several minutes on a target, the number will start dropping. There we go, now we're down to under 1.2 again. So... AVX is pretty good. <coughs> That's pretty good. Through the mount cable line. Yeah. Yep. No doubt. The through the through the mount cabling is another good aspect of it. And like I said, I I really did strongly consider a couple of used CEM 40s that came up in a, in the LA area over the last couple of months. I really debated on that, but I just couldn't allow myself to spend two grand on a mount. So. Especially when I'm only doing 60 second subs in EAA. If I, now, if I wanted to get into AP and do the kind of work you do with much longer subs and letting things go, letting things go for hours at a time, yeah, it would be totally worth it. But I am just an EAA guy, and I like just getting what I get just sitting out here for a couple of hours doing, you know, 10 or a dozen or 15 objects in a, a couple of hours and calling it done. So, I like speed and I like doing a bunch of things, not spending a bunch of time on time on one thing, so just not for me. Yeah, see, now we're down to almost one flat. <coughs> yeah, if I spend time, I mean, I wonder what this, if I just left it on a one target for a couple of hours, I wonder where the, if it would get down to like 0 0.8, 0 0.7. Probably not, but it's nice to have a, a dream. Yeah, and I like watching your I like watching your broadcast too. And I really, really wish that I could figure out why YouTube was not sending me email notifications when my subscribers do events. I mean, I get when somebody leaves a comment on one of my videos, 
I get an email. When somebody subscribes to me, I get an email. But for some reason, when you and Gary and Doug and anybody else do a live stream, set something up, I never get notified. Even though I have subscribed to all of you guys and I have the bell rung for all of you guys, I have it set to do that. You know, and you and I have actually looked at that. We've poked around in my settings and I don't understand why I don't get emails when the people I'm subscribed to have a live stream. I don't get it. I get all the other YouTube emails, all the other notifications. I just don't get notifications about live streams. It kind of sucks, so. But, anyway, there you are. But I'll definitely come bug you at any time I know that you're doing one. So, maybe you haven't been doing them that often. I didn't get point four eight. Let's see if I've... Oh, man, I went up to 1.3. Yeah, the deck axis went a little high. So I went up to 1.3. I was almost down to one flat, which is really good for me. <laughs> but look at that. I get nice round stars. That's all I need in my little 60-second subs. Just nice round stars. Yeah, I know. Everybody gets notifications about my stuff. I just can't seem to get notifications about theirs, which sucks. Oh, well. I think I'm about ready to call it a night anyway. It's getting late for me, and it's going to be an early morning, so... I think I am going to call it quits, but the cocoon came out pretty nice, actually. I think that's, uh, that came out pretty darn nice. Not too bad at all. Yep, and I get some pretty, I mean, they get a little eggy sometimes, but, you know, as long as, as long as the RA and deck are about the same, they're round. Which is, you know, right now they're round. I'm at 1.4 now, but still, I get round stars. So, that's, uh, that's good. That's just good stuff. Yeah, not too bad for 14 minutes. Not too bad at all. on it. I think we're probably pretty good though. And I think that's pretty good. But I think I'm going to call it a night. So, thanks for being here, Greg. Chatting me up. And, uh, yeah, let me know. You know, whenever you do a live stream, send me an email. I'll, I'll come hang. Um, I uh, I would if I got the stupid YouTube emails, but I don't. But uh, good seeing you. And uh, we'll probably talk again soon, I hope. I will, uh, meantime, pack it up. Oh, so you're off tomorrow. I gotta go do some grocery shopping and run errands and stuff tomorrow, so I'm gonna try and get into town early while well, it's still cool. But anyway, I'm gonna call it a night, so thanks, Greg. I'll talk to you later. Good night, everyone. <laughs>